by the way, even though it is cold outside, um, you know, it's, it's good that we can be here, right? You know, I think that um, so many times we uh, oftentimes just kind of find excuses not to uh, come into the Lord's house and, and worship Him, but, uh, but we should. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously times that we can't, and, you know, when the roads are bad or, or whatever, but, um, you know, at the same time, we, we need to at least say, hey, if we, if we can meet, um, then we should meet because it really is a, a, an honor and a, a privilege uh, to be in the Lord's house. And it's, it's something that is uh, important for us as well, important for our spiritual lives. Okay, so how about if we turn to the book of Proverbs this morning, and we are going to take a look at several pro uh, Proverbs in chapter 17. And so I've got chapter 17 written up there on the board, but at the same time, we're actually going to skip on over and look at one in chapter 19 later on. But for the most part, we're going to stay in Proverbs chapter 17. And today we're going to be talking about having peace. You know, when you think about things today, we really have a lot of turmoil in, uh, in our lives. I mean, you know, you, you flip on the news, you, you know, go to news sites, and, uh, you know, it just seems like uh, world over, we've got a lot of political turmoil that is uh, in, at play. And not only that, but you, you look at not just simply international events, but you take a look at just our, our national events, our society events, and we've got a lot of turmoil um, that's there, whether it's politics or whether it's social issues or whatever, uh, you know, you know, crime. It just seems like there's a lot of different turmoil um, that's in play in it. And all those things sometimes can filter down uh, to us individually. And it seems like a lot of times we have a lot of turmoil just simply in our own personal lives and uh, turmoil with, with one another, uh, turmoil in families too. And so wouldn't it simply uh, be nice to have peace? You know, when we look at all those things and just like, man, if we could just have some, some peace in, in all of it, that'd be great. Well, as far as national events and international events, um, I, I am of the opinion that although we can have peace and should try to find peace uh, to certain problems, we're not going to have ultimate peace until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, comes back again. Um, but at the same time, you know, as far as individually, uh, as far as we ourselves, that's what we're going to be really focusing on this morning as far as having peace. Uh, and peace is something that we really can and should have in our lives. It should be something that we have in our uh, relationships that we have with, with friends, with coworkers. Um, but I'm especially going to be tailoring this more towards families uh, because if you think about all the different structures of society between like international stuff and national stuff and, and on down, uh, it's that, that family structure that is the, the core nucleus of everything. It's that family structure that seems to be left out. And so as far as we ourselves go, and you think about it, you know, families, there's the ones that you're around the most. Um, uh, having peace, especially in the home, is something that is a, 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 an important thing. And so how do we go about doing it? Well, that's what we're going to be looking at with these various Proverbs. And the first one that we're going to look at is Proverbs chapter 17 and verse number one. So in the very first proverb of chapter 17, and by the way, when you take a look at the book of Proverbs, um, oftentimes just simply one verse really doesn't have much of a connection to the other verse. Sometimes they're paired together as far as subject matter goes, and sometimes a proverb is going to extend over a couple of different verses. But Proverbs, by their nature, are just simply short sayings. And so, you know, here is the first proverb that we've got in chapter 17, which is, Better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. And so what we see here is just simply uh, asking ourselves, is, is having peace really worth it? And what we've got is a comparison of two different houses here, Right. And so when you look at this proverb, you got the very first part, a house um, that is uh, in peace and quiet, but at the same time, they, they don't have a lot of material things. They're barely skimping by. But when you contrast that with another house that has a lot, 
has a lot of provision, but it is a house of strife, then you got to ask yourself, you know, which one is better, right? You know, it is better to be in a house where, you know, you get along. It's better to be in a house where it's a house of love and it's a house that, uh, you know, everybody is working together and cooperating together. It's a, a house of peace and it's a house of quiet. Um, that kind of house, you know, is something that even if you don't have a lot of material possessions, it's better to be in that house than in a house where you've got a lot of material possessions, but you've got a lot of strife, you've got a lot of arguing, you've got a lot of fighting, you've got a lot of chaos and turmoil, right? Now, we got to understand what this is talking about, what it's not talking about, um, and that is that it's not saying that the house full of feasting is bad in and of itself, right? It's not saying that a house with dry, crusty bread, and that's the only thing you got to eat, is somehow virtuous and noble. That, that's not the issue here. What the issue is just simply is saying, okay, which, which is better, you know? Which, which is more valuable? And the reason why I bring this up is because a lot of times what we think in our society is we think that the money is the most important thing, right? Especially when you're in a family situation, the, the focus oftentimes in many families is let's go get more money. If we go get more money, then therefore we are going to be able to do more things. And that is true. You know, when you go and you get more money, then you can have bigger house. You can have a better car. You can go on vacations. You can do more stuff. There's, there's a lot of different things that money will provide. And I'm not saying that those things are wrong. It's not that, you know, having money and having things and doing things is bad. But when you look at it in terms of comparison, is it the most important thing? Because it's better to have a family that's intact and it's better to have a family that is at peace with one another and a family that gets along. It's better to have peace and quiet and not having so much than having a, a house where you've got a lot of stuff, but you've got a lot of fighting and arguing and turmoil that's there, right? So we oftentimes think that the money is the most important thing, but really what we need to do is kind of adjust that a little bit and say, no, money's not the most important thing. Actually, peace is the most important thing. Having that relationship one to another, whether it's husbands and wives, it's parents to kids, it's kids to kids, or even if you want to extend that out to where, you know, your extended family or extend that out to your coworkers and your friends, you know, you need to understand that having peaceful connections and peaceful relationships with one another to where that filters into your life and your peace and quiet, having a peace and quiet life, you know, that is something that money really can't buy. And it's something that is even more important than money. Because after all, what is the better to, to you know, you're going to live in this big mansion that's empty or you're going to live in this big mansion where everybody underneath it hates each other and lives and, and, and operates in separate rooms. Or are you going to have just simply a modest house where everybody gets along? You know, when you start to think about it in that regard, then, yeah, it's better to live in modest means and have peace and quiet than it is to have a whole lot and to sit there and have arguing and turmoil. So since peace is so important, how are we going to achieve it, right? It's one thing to say it's better to have this peace and quiet than it is to have money, but okay, how are we gonna go and go about and get it? All right, so here we're gonna take a look at all the rest of these Proverbs that's going to tell us some things that we need to do in order to have peace. And so if you take a look at verse number nine, what we see is that peace is going to be something and to have peace, it means that we've got to have forgiveness. Peace requires forgiveness. Now in verse number nine, it says, he who covers over an offense promotes love, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. And so when we look at this proverb, we see that this proverb is really a contrast. It's contrasting a couple of different things. It's contrasting somebody who's going to be covering over an offense, and that is contrasted with whoever is repeating the matter. 
And so, you know, here is some kind of, of, of issue that crops up, whether this is between close friends or it's between husband and wife or between parents and kids or whether it's between coworkers, whatever the situation is. Here is this matter, right? There is some sort of problem. There's some sort of controversy that had arisen within itself. And what's better to do is if, if, if you can, through love, cover over the offense, it's going to promote the love. But if you constantly go and bring it up and bring it up and bring it up and repeat it, then what's going to happen is even the closest of friends are going to be separated. And you know, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If you think about you going and having a problem with somebody or somebody has a problem with you, and then, you know, you, you kind of get over it and you smooth it over, but then somebody is going to come up and they're going to bring it up again and they're going to hold a grudge and they're going to bring it up again, right? And they're going to hold a grudge and they're going to bring it up again. Then what's going to happen? Eventually, that relationship, the, the people that are involved with it are going to say, you know what? I, I'm tired of messing with this. This is, uh, this is something that, I, you know, I'm not getting anything from this. I, I'm tired of, of having these things brought up and brought up and brought up. And so if a matter is repeated over and over and over and over again, you can see how it's going to separate those close friends. But you notice that what it says here is that he who covers over an offense promotes love. And so if somebody's able to go and overlook things and offer forgiveness instead of a grudge, then what's going to happen is eventually that's going to promote love. Because if you stop and think about it, none of us are perfect. And so since none of us are perfect, we're always going to do something that is going to have a problem, right? And so, you know, you do something that uh, maybe you didn't mean really. And, and you know, it caused uh, an offense to somebody that you're, you're, you're close with. At the same time, if they're not going to hold it against you, and if they're going to, uh, you know, smooth it over and let it go, then chances are you're going to get closer to the person. And you're going to say, you know, this is somebody that I can trust, and this is going to be somebody who's a friend. Now, understand what we're not talking about here is we're not talking about, uh, you know, just kind of uh, 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 sweeping issues under the rug. We're not just simply saying, okay, uh, here we've got a problem, especially like, you know, between the husband and wife, we've got a problem between two different friends. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that's there. It's something that's obvious, but, you know, we're, we're just going to sweep it under the rug. We're going to get rid of it. You know, you, you talk to different um, relationship experts and they say, you don't want to do that. You want to be open. You want to be honest with people, because if you do that, uh, you're going to bring on the resentment and everything like that. That's uh, that's obvious. But you see, that's really what we're not talking about here. We're not saying don't bring it up in order to have a constructive conversation about it. What we're talking about here is this offense. And that is that somebody does something to you that creates some sort of anger within you. It's an offense to you. And instead of, uh, you know, forgiving the person and getting over the emotional attachment, you're hanging on to it and you're developing that grudge that's there. And from hanging on to that grudge, then what you're going to do is you're going to bring it up and you're going to bring it up and you're going to bring it up. You know, if somebody starts to do it in a similar situation, you're going to bring it up and say, you know, you always do this. You, you, you always take, you're always constantly, you know, that's not, um, uh, <laughs> that's not something that's going to be constructive, is it? So what we're talking about here is just simply offering love. And as a matter of fact, when you think about the things in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 about love, um, one thing that love, true godly love does is it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Okay. And so if we don't keep that record of wrongs, if what we're doing is just simply saying, you know what, this person did what they did, um, but they're not perfect. And, uh, I'm going to choose to love them anyway. And maybe we have need to have a conversation about, you know, what it is so that we can get past it. We can do that. But the one thing that you don't want to do is you don't want to say, I'm hanging on to it. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to forgive the person. I'm going to just hold on to it and let that be that because uh, pretty soon that relationship is going to be fractured and going away and peace is not going to be there. So having peace requires having forgiveness. Now, something else, and that is having peace really means that we let arguments go. 
Okay, so let's go on down to verse number 14. <clears throat> In verse number 14, what we see is kind of a comparison to what happens when we have a quarrel with somebody or an argument. In verse number 14, it says, starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. Now, when you take a look at verse number, the first part of verse number 14, where it says starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, it's really talking about the letting out of water. And so you've got water that's contained in some way. You know, it's contained with the dam, it's contained with a, a glass, it's contained, you know, you got water that's, that's right there, okay? And so what happens if you take the water cup and you knock it over? Water just goes everywhere, right? You know, what happens when you got a dam and you got all the water that's contained there? What happens when you've got a, a crack in it? Well, it starts out slow, but then it breaks out and then it goes all everywhere. And when it goes all everywhere, especially, you know, you, you're at your desk working, you knock over your water cup and it goes all over your computer, and then you got a problem, right? You know, if you're out and you've got a dam that's supposed to be protecting stuff and the water breaks out and goes and floods everything else, then you've got a problem. And so here's this comparison, and that is that we've got this breaching of this dam, right? Where the water is going to spill out or knocking something over a water cup where the water is going to spill out and then cause a bunch of problems. We've got that compared to where it says here is simply drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. So here you've got the comparison of somebody who's quarreling with somebody, right? You know, when you talk about quarreling, you're talking about some sort of argument. You're talking about some sort of, of verbal altercation. You know, somebody says something that you take offense to and you say something back. And because you say something back, then they're going to say something back. And before you know it, you've got a problem on your hands, right? And so what it's saying is just like containing that water and breaching the dam and everything, you know, you, you need to be the big person to just simply drop it. Be all before all of a sudden this dispute breaks out, you know, because if you're responding back to that person, if they're responding back to you and then you're responding back and they're responding back and you get into this altercation and you get into this argument, then where is it going to end? And once it does end, after the water has already run out and you're already spilled out of everything, how much damage has been done and how much damage has been done to that relationship. And so what it's saying here is that, you know what, it's better if you just simply uh, uh, be the bigger person and just simply say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm letting it go um, because if you don't, then you got a lot of devastation. And sometimes we just simply say, oh, well, it, it's just a little fighting. It's just a little argument. It's just a little quarrel. But we need to understand that even those little bitty fights, those little bitty quarrels, sometimes can have very devastating effects, right? Because if it happens once, then it can happen again, and then it can happen again, and it can happen again. And it's better to just simply drop the matter before all of a sudden this dispute breaks out. Something else, and that is having peace requires showing humility, okay? Now, let's take a look at verse number 19. So in verse number 19, it says, He who loves a quarrel loves sin. He who builds a high gate invites destruction. So when we look at this and we think, okay, what in the world is this talking about? Um, this is really talking about a comparison. And the comparison is somebody who is loving an argument to somebody who is building a high gate. And you say, okay, well, I, I, I don't understand this idea about this high gate sort of thing. Okay, well, think about in this regard. Think, think if you live back in that time period and think about if you had, you know, a little house and if you had some sort of, of walled area around your house, okay? And so let's say that your house was relatively modest and your wall was relatively modest, but you want people to think that you are better off than what you are, right? And so what you're going to do is you're going to build a high gate in front of it. And so when passerbys are going by your house, they're going to look at this big gate and they're going to say, wow, this guy is really well off. Now, once they get past the gate, they're going to say, well, wait a minute, there's not really a whole lot here. 
okay? But people are looking at high gate and they're going to say, man, this guy is loaded. This guy's rich. Or maybe, you know, it's the front door. It's the entryway to your door of, wow, this guy's got a really big house. And what really is happening is you're kind of inviting destruction there because if somebody's looking and seeing a, a rich facade, then they're assuming that there's riches inside. And then all of a sudden, you know, somebody could break in and steal what little you have left, right? And so there's the idea about the high gate. Now, where it says at the very beginning of the verse, he who loves a quarrel is loving sin, okay? And so you say, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, this idea about loving a quarrel is really talking about somebody who is going to um, be uh, 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 really loving to offend, okay? And so this person who is there in comparison to high gate is somebody who is really wanting to, to press buttons with people. Have you ever noticed anybody like that? You know, somebody who just really likes to get on people's nerves. Somebody who's really apt at offending other people and they almost get a delight and a joy out of offending other person, right? And so, you know, you got people out there today who are like, and they're very proud that they don't have any filters in what they say. You know, oh, I don't have any filters in what I say. Um, you know what? We need to have filters in what we say, because if you stop and think about uh, like, you know, saying unfiltered things is a lot like drinking unfiltered water. You know, would you like to go and I, you know, I've got water here and a nice scummy pond. Would you like to have unfiltered pond water or would you like to have filtered pond water? Chances are you want filtered pond water, right? And if you stop and think about it, the things that we say that are unfiltered oftentimes have all the kind of scummy crap <laughs> that the pond has just in verbal form, right? And so it's better to have filtered speech than unfiltered speech. But you stop and think, okay, why does somebody have the unfiltered speech? Why does somebody want to be out there causing problems? Why does somebody want to be out there offending? And how does that relate and compare to somebody who has a high gate? Okay, well, somebody who has a high gate is somebody who is wanting to show something that is different than the reality. Somebody who is wanting to impress, somebody who is wanting to, uh, you know, uh, 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 give a false facade of who they really are and what they really are. And if you think about people who go and, and you know, will say anything that comes to mind, you know, chances are that it really does come to mind. It's just that they are intentionally saying it. Somebody who's going and, um, you know, intentionally trying to offend or intentionally trying to get into a fight to someone, it could be that what they're trying to do is they're trying to put up a false facade. They're trying to make it things appear on the exterior different than what is on the interior. And there is the match between the high gate in somebody who is loving to quarrel, okay? So when you love to quarrel, what really happens when you're wanting to offend is what happens is you're loving to sin. And when you love to sin, then what happens is you are inviting destruction as well. What we need to do is instead of trying to, uh, you know, save face, instead of trying to go and, uh, you know, uh, have a, a prideful facade, what we need to do is we need to show humility. You know, when we're in a quarrel with somebody, um, it's very easy to try to save face and beat the other person. But really what we need to do is just simply have a little bit of humility within ourselves. And when we have humility within ourselves, then oftentimes the argument and the problem can just simply die down and go away. Uh, harsh words are ones that are going to stir up the trouble, but kind words are oftentimes going to soothe over a problem. And so what we need to do is we need to have that filter within us. We need to keep our head about us. And we need to have that humility of just simply saying, you know what? I don't always have to be right about this. I don't always have to win an argument. I don't always have to appear to be big. And I don't always have to appear to be the one that is in charge and defeat somebody else. Sometimes we need to be the pro, uh, have humility to just simply say, okay. You know, I had a good friend one time um, named Joe. 
uh, who, uh, you know, somebody was trying to draw him into an argument, a friendly argument. And uh, Joe just wasn't biting on it. He was just sitting there, you know, doing nothing, just saying, okay, whatever. Okay. Now, of course, this is a lot of joking around, but, you know, finally the guy that was trying to drive him into the argument just simply said, Joe, why are you just sitting there like an, a, a rock? And Joe just turned around and said, yeah, because a rock doesn't argue, you know? And sometimes that's the way we need to be, is we need to be that rock that's just not going to argue. Okay. Yeah. If you want to fight about this, well, you know, fight amongst yourself because I'm not going to be a part of it. Right? Okay. Something else we need to do is that following peace requires, or having peace requires following God's commands about things. Now, this is where we skip on over to Proverbs chapter 19. And in Proverbs chapter 19 in verse number 13, it says this, A foolish son is his father's ruin, and a quarrelsome wife is like a constant dripping. Okay? All right. So here we have these, um, uh, you know, a, 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 I guess a, a pronouncement about what really a, a misguided and the effect a misguided home is going to have. You look at this verse and you see a foolish son is uh, in, in parallel with a quarrelsome wife. And so here we've got this home. We've got this son who's being foolish and we've got this wife who is also being foolish, but her foolishness is not generalized like the son is. It's just simply specified to saying a wife that wants to nag, wife wants to argue, a wife that wants to be contentious and so on and so forth, okay? And so both of these, the foolish son, the contentious or the um, a quarrelsome wife is going to be one that is going to cause problems, okay? The foolish son is going to go and cause his father's ruin. You know, when you think about families and you think about kids, um, you know, it, it is hard sometimes to be a parent. And especially when you have a son or a daughter that is going to grow up and, uh, you know, the things that they, they are taught, hopefully we teach them. But, you know, the things that they are taught, they are ignoring and they're doing their own thing. And then we have to come back and all those consequences fall on ourselves. Or sometimes the kids don't and aren't taught. And therefore, the consequences still fall back on ourselves. But, you know, the fact is the same. And that is oftentimes the parents are the ones dealing with the foolishness that the kids produce. And sometimes that foolishness is one of ruin. It's a financial ruin. It is emotional ruin. It is, uh, you know, something that is, is stress and sometimes health ruin. And so here we've got a, a, a foolish son is going to be the father's ruin. And at the same time, we've got this quarrelsome wife and the quarrelsome wife because of all the constant nagging and all the constant quarreling and all the constant um, uh, contention that is there. It's just like that dripping faucet. And, uh, you know, hopefully with the, the bad weather out there, maybe you got your faucet dripping, you know, if, if you're home and, uh, you know, you're listening to that dripping faucet and it's driving you crazy, maybe just run your faucet on full for, you know, a minute or two, and then you can shut it off for a while. But anyway, you know, you get the idea there. And so when we look at this and we say, okay, well, that's, you know, specifying the, the sons and it's specifying the, the wife. We need to understand that in the bigger premise of things is that, you know, God has given very specific instructions for husbands and very specific directions for wives, very specific direction for children and very specific directions for parents as well. And it takes all of us doing our thing in order to have that peace that's there, right? You know, so when you look at husbands, and of course, we don't have a husband mentioned here because he's the one that's, that all of this is coming back on at this point. But, you know, in the Bible, it talks about how husbands are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church. That is a husband's responsibility. That's what we need to do. And so if we love our lives as Christ loved the church, or at least we do our best to do that, then we are doing our best to hold that unity in place in, um, in our family. But if we ignore that and we just simply say, hey, I'm going to do what I do, want to do, and I don't care about my wife, I don't care about my family, then all of a sudden we've got the consequences that come from that. 
Same time, wives have got a commandment that they are supposed to respect their, their husbands. And so if a wife does not respect her husband, if the wife is always trying to take charge, if the wife is one that, you know, as an example here in this proverb, is one that is quarreling back and forth, then there's going to be a problem there. Same way with kids. Kids are supposed to be obedient to their parents. If they aren't obedient to their parents, then all of a sudden they are grow up to be a foolish kid. And then the parents have got all the consequences coming back on that. Parents are supposed to go and uh, teach their children the ways of the Lord. And if we teach our children the ways of the Lord, then hopefully they're not going to grow up to be foolish, right? And so it takes all of those people doing what God commands in order for that relationship to work. You know, we oftentimes think as far as the Lord's commands is that they're restrictive and uh, they're, they're binding and they're, they're preventing us from really doing what we really want to do. But when you really stop to think about it, God giving us commands are really a way of us to have protection within ourselves. You know, it is God who is our creator and God who knows us. God is setting up limits, not because he wants to constrain us, but God is setting up limits because he wants us to operate within what would be the best thing for a person or for a family to do. And so whenever we start to step out away from those commands, then we start to have problems. And so if we, for example, if we're just simply, um, you know, with a, a coworker or we're the friend or something like that, um, we always need to remember what God has commanded us as far as to be certain kind of people. And if we are the kind of person that God wants us to be, then that is the best way for us to keep those relationships intact. But if we step out of those relationships, then all of a sudden we might harm that relationship, much like a fuller son would harm the relationship with his father, or a contentious wife is going to harm the relationship with her husband as well. Now, we need to understand that really having peace is something that is a deliberate act, okay? Oftentimes we think that having peace is just automatically going to happen, right? We're just going to automatically fall into it. But we need to understand that in order to have peace, then we have got to do certain things. You know, when you go down through this list about forgiving somebody, forgiving is not going to just simply be something that automatically happens. It's going to be something that we oftentimes are going to have to look at and say, I'm going to make a decision to do this. And we've got to make a plan to put it into action. Same thing with letting arguments go. You know, the way that it is with arguments is one person says something, the other person says something back, the other person says something, you say something back, right? It's just a chain reaction that happens. In order for us to let the argument go, we've got to make a deliberate act to break that process and to break that cycle. We've got to say, no, wait a minute. I'm not going to do this. I don't want to be one that loves to quarrel because I don't be the one to be the one that uh, knocks over the water glass or breaches the dam. You know, I, I'm just going to let it go and let things remain in place. But it takes that choice. It takes that action. Same thing with showing humility. You know, we ourselves, we don't like to show humility because if we show humility, we think we're showing weakness. But oftentimes, it's not weakness. It really is kind of a controlled strength within ourselves in order to just simply say, okay, that's fine. You know, following God's commands is something that is absolutely not automatic. Following God's commands is something that we've got to put on our forefront. We've got to put on the Old Testament it talks about writing them on your forehead, putting it on your forehead and putting it on your heart. I mean, it's got to be on our head and it's got to be on our emotional side to do what God wants us to do so that we can make those choices. And so to have peace, we've got to make a decision to do these things, right? You know, we expect, oh, peace is just going to automatically be there. But, you know, we're people and we make mistakes. and We do things that are wrong and we do things that are bad and harmful to other people. And so that's what's naturally going to happen. We've got to do the unnatural thing and make decisions to do the things that actually have peace and will provide peace. And so, do you want peace? 
You know, after all, it's better to live in a little bitty shack with a dry, crusty loaf of bread in peace and quiet than it is in a mansion that's full of feasting. And so hopefully you want peace because peace is something that's a really good thing to have. But to do it, we've got to make the decision to go get it. We've got to say, you know what? I want peace. I want peace in my family. I want peace in my relationship with friends. I want peace with my relationship with coworkers. And we've got to be willing to do the things that are required to do that. Now, one other thing before we leave off, and that is uh, in order to have peace with other people, we've got to have some peace within ourselves, right? If we are discontented within ourselves, then it's going to be high, really hard for us to be able to have peace with other people. And so to have peace within ourselves, the first thing that we need to do is we need to have peace with God. You know, to have peace with God, we've got to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Once we are justified by faith, according to Romans chapter 5, verse 1, we have peace with God. And so, you know, somebody's watching this and they are not a Christian. They have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Then you don't have peace with God. And if you don't have peace with God, then it's going to be hard to find real, true, genuine peace within yourself. But if you come to the point in your life where you realize that you're a sinner and you realize that Jesus Christ has taken away your sin because of what he has done for you on the cross in his resurrection, then that's how we can have peace with God and we can have a relationship with God. Once we have that relationship with God, then what we need to do is we still need to have peace within ourselves. And by having peace within ourselves, we need to have a good conscience before God. A good conscience before God is just simply doing the things that God wants us to do. And so if we have a good conscience before God, if we have peace with God, then we can look and say, okay, how am I going to put all this into practice? Which hopefully we're going to make the decision to do. Let's all bow our heads and let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your guidance and we thank you for your instruction. And we ask that you please be with us and please lead us and guide us within these um, scriptures that we looked at this morning. Lord, please help us to find out some of our weaknesses and our faults and help us to um, have the grace and the mercy to look at these things and uh, try to do better. Lord, we ask that you be at the lost wherever they are. Help them to understand that uh, you love them and that you have uh, um, sent your son to die for them to have peace. And Lord, we ask that you please uh, be at our world over. Help uh, everyone to understand who you are. And uh, Lord, we ask that you come quickly. Lord, please forgive us of our sins. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.